We're now going to talk a little bit about electronegativity before we start drawing molecules. So to get started, electronegativity is a periodic trend, which is what we saw in topic four, such as atomic radius and ionization energy. But the reason why we saved electronegativity until now is because the definition of electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself when bonded to another atom. And that's important. Electronegativity is a moot point until the atom is actually bonded to something else. The trend of electronegativity can be quantified or added numbers using the Pauling scale. If you take a look at the image of the periodic table that is shown at the bottom left here, you'll see the general trend of electronegativity. Electronegativity is going to increase as you move up a group and to the right. One notable exception about this is that helium, neon, and argon are excluded from this trend. So based on the electronegativity trend, we would find that the element fluorine would be the most electronegative element on the periodic table. The periodic table that you see here on the right is a three-dimensional uh, picture of the periodic table to just show the general variation and trend of electronegativity. So as you go up a group, you notice that the squares get a little bit more elevated, indicating the electronegativity is greater. But the more pronounced is as you move across the period. Notice as you move to the right of the periodic table, especially when you get around fluorine, the values for electronegativity get higher. Like I said, this can be quantified using the Pauling scale. The image that you see here is the general Pauling value for every single element. Notice that helium, neon, and argon do not have values because they would not generally be bonded to anything and therefore would have no electronegativity value. Remember that fluorine is the most electronegative uh, element on the periodic table. Notice its Pauling value or Pauling scale is 4.0. So 4.0 is the highest Pauling value. And then if you were to reverse the trend, francium is going to be the least electronegative element on the periodic table with a value of approximately 0.7. Every other element is going to span the range between these two numbers. The higher the, the value, the more electronegative that the element is. Now you don't have to memorize these values, that's not necessary. However, there are six that you, need, you do need to memorize. You need to know fluorine. You also need to know oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and boron. Now the nice thing is, if you look at their values, as long as you know that fluorine is four, they decrease by 0.5 as you move to the left. The last element that I would like you to know, in addition to these five that I just pointed out here, is hydrogen. And notice hydrogen's kind of got a weird one, it's 2.1. So those are the six values that you need to know. Other than that, you won't need to, I'll either need to give you the value for the element, or you can use the trend of increasing up and to the right in order to answer any questions that you may need to. So let's take a look at three molecules to nail uh, down this idea of electronegativity. So what you're seeing is electron densities for three molecules. The first molecule is the hydrogen molecule, which is H2, or think about it, you have two hydrogens bonded to each other. The next molecule is HF, which think about it is a hydrogen bonded to a fluorine. And then the last molecule is NaF, a sodium bonded to a fluorine. The areas that you see red are where the electrons are. So if you notice, the electrons in the hydrogen molecule are right here in the middle. And that makes sense because think about it. You've got these electrons that are in the middle. This hydrogen is trying to pull the electrons towards itself. This hydrogen is also trying to pull the electrons towards itself. But since they're both the same element, they both have the same pull or the same strength. In other words, the same electronegativity. So it's kind of like a really uninteresting game of tug of war. They're both pulling with the same strength. So it makes sense that the electrons are in between. If you take a look at HF, you can see that the red is on this side where the fluorine is. That indicates that the electrons must be pulled a little bit closer to fluorine than hydrogen, which makes sense because fluorine is more electronegative. It's stronger. Finally, you see like we have this indentation. This indicates that not only are the electrons on this side where the fluorine is, but they're pulled so tightly that they're really, really, really close to the fluorine. Now, what does that tell us about the different types of bonds that these three molecules have? Well, let's take a look at this slide right here. We can actually determine what kind of bond that two atoms will have as long as we know the electronegativity difference. If we know the electronegativity difference is less than 
then the bond is considered nonpolar covalent. What does that mean, nonpolar covalent? Well, we know what covalent means, right? We learned in topic five that covalent means shared. The electrons are being shared in between. But what does nonpolar mean? Nonpolar essentially means even or balanced. Some, some even say equal. So in the case of the hydrogen molecule or the two hydrogens bonded together, since they both have the exact same electronegativity value, 2.1, the electronegativity difference between these two is zero, which is definitely less than 0.5. What does that mean? That means the electrons are being shared equally or evenly between the two atoms. The bond between a hydrogen and hydrogen is a nonpolar covalent bond. A polar covalent bond is going to be when you have an electronegativity difference is between 0.5 and 2.0. So in the case of hydrogen bonded to fluorine, Hydrogen is 2.1, fluorine had a value of 4. The difference between these two is 1.9, which falls in between this range. That means the bond between these two elements, hydrogen and fluorine, it's still covalent, which means the electrons are still shared, but they're being shared unequally. That's what polar means. And so the electrons would actually be a little bit closer to fluorine than it would hydrogen. And that's why we noticed the electron density had that red shading on the right side where fluorine is. When you have a polar covalent molecule, you need to show that there is an uneven distribution of charge. So how do we do that? This is what you will do when you have a polar covalent bond. If I ask you to draw a polar arrow, what you'll do is above the two atoms that are bonded together, you would draw an arrow pointing towards the more electronegative element. This indicates that the electrons are shifting closer to that element. Also notice the tail of the arrow looks like a plus sign. This indicates that the hydrogen has a slightly positive charge. Why? Because the electrons are closer to the fluorine side. Another way you can show this is through the use of delta notation. The Greek symbol for lowercase delta kind of looks like a fancy S, which means partial. So if I say that fluorine has a partially negative charge, it's because the electrons are closer to this side, meaning hydrogen would have a slightly or partial positive charge. I'll go over this on the next slide as well, but reminder, you only have to do this notation when you're looking at a polar bond. Notice I didn't have to do that with nonpolar because the electrons are shared evenly. Finally, if the electronegativity difference is greater than its 2.0 or greater, then no longer is it covalent. Notice it's ionic. And remember with ionic, the electrons are not shared, they are transferred. And so in the case of sodium being bonded to fluorine, sodium has an electronegativity value of approximately 0 0.9, fluorine is 4.0. That difference is 3.1, definitely greater than 2.0, which means the electrons are no longer shared. The electrons are completely transferred to the fluorine, meaning fluorine is now the negative ion or anion, and the sodium is now the positive ion or cation, which recall, this is actually what an ionic bond is, right? It's a bond between a cation and an anion. On this slide right here, this just goes over the symbology that I was going over on the previous slide. You have the dipole arrow here. You also have the delta notation there. So a reminder that delta notation or the dipole arrow is only for polar bonds. So let's do an example to end this video. In example one, I'm asking you to determine what kind of bond would take place between the pair of elements shown below. So in the first one, we have chlorine bonding to fluorine. I want you to know what kind of bond would that be? And so chlorine, you have to know the electronegativity values, which is why I give you this values here. Chlorine has a value of 3.0, Fluorine is 4.0. The difference between that is 1.0, which means it's a polar covalent bond. So this is going to be, and I'll write it over here, polar covalent. Since it's polar covalent, let's go ahead and draw what that symbology would look like. Fluorine is more electronegative of 4.0, so I'm going to draw my arrow pointing towards fluorine, meaning fluorine is now slightly negative. 
and chlorine is more slightly positive. What about cesium bonded to bromine? That's our second one. Cesium, which is point, it, 0 0.7. Bromine is right here, it's 2.8. The difference between these two values is 2.1, which is greater than two. So this is going to be ionic. I don't have to draw anything for ionic. Remember, the notation is only for polar covalent. So I just have to write ionic. And we could have guessed it was ionic because cesium is a metal, bromine is a nonmetal. So metals and nonmetals typically bond to form ionic compounds. What about carbon and hydrogen? And I'll do that down here. Carbon is 2.5, hydrogen is 2.1. The difference between those two values is 0 0.4, which is below the threshold for a polar covalent molecule. So this is nonpolar covalent. More or less, those electrons are shared evenly between the carbon and the hydrogen. This is actually a really important bond to know. I want you to write down in your notes that the carbon-hydrogen bond is always nonpolar. That's going to help us out when we get on to some later topics. Finally, we're looking at nitrogen bonded to phosphorus. Nitrogen is 3.0. Phosphorus is 2.1. The difference between those two is 0.9, which falls into the polar covalent category. If it's polar covalent, we need to draw our arrows. Nitrogen is the more electronegative, so I'm going to draw the arrow pointing towards the nitrogen, meaning nitrogen is slightly negative, and phosphorus is slightly positive. That wraps up Section 2. We'll see you in Section 3.